Rameshwar Das is a writer, photographer, and co-author of several of Ram Das's books, including Be Loved Now, Polishing the Mirror, and Being Ram Das. Rameshwar Das was a close friend of Ram Das for over 50 years, and he was given his name by Neem Karoli Baba. Linda Solomon Wood is the CEO of Observer Media Group and founder and editor-in-chief of Canada's National Observer. She previously founded Vancouver Observer and has led both observers to win Canada's top awards for public service, investigative journalism, and excellence in reporting. It's an honor to welcome both of you today, and I now turn it over to you, Ramesh and Linda. Thank you so much, Jacob. It's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> I want to welcome you all again. And yeah, I'm Linda Solomon Wood, and I'm editor in chief of Canada's National Observer, which is Canada's climate news leader. And why I am with you today and with R Ramesh is that Ramesh and I go back years and years and years to when I lived in New York and we were very good friends. So it's really, really great to be here today. And Ramesh, it's so great to have you with us in Canada. I'm so happy to be here. And the last time I was physically at Banyan was just about 10 years ago when um, we had a reading for uh, Be Loved Now. And it was a great program for Seva Foundation, as I remember. That um, brings me right to my first thought about this. You know, when you, when we started talking about doing this interview together, you know, I thought back to my relationship with Ram Dass, which was all, only really through his books. And I thought back to the first time I picked up Be Here Now, which I'm sure a lot of people, all of you on this call are probably thinking about too. Um, and it had a pretty profound effect on me because it was eye-opening and it was, you know, here was this guy, now I know that he was translating a lot of ideas that came from Eastern thinking and bringing it to us in the West. So I just wondered, uh, you know, to open up our interview, what would you, what do you think his effect on the culture has been? Well, I, he's, um through that synthesis of psychology and his work in psychedelics and that very profound experience in uh, India and becoming a, a yogi, um, he really has shaped a lot of the uh, culture in spiritual terms for the West, especially the great number of people that now identify as spiritual, not religious so much. Uh, because of that uh, eclectic uh, mix that he was able to translate and, uh, you know, bring to uh, all of us through uh, storytelling and, uh, you know, the kind of uh, ability to synthesize all of these strains that uh, uh, came along. I mean, when you go back to Be Here Now, the yoga instruction is pretty uh, comprehensive. Yeah, and it's still what is you know uh, now on practically every street corner and in every town. So, One of the things uh, I really remember yeah. about it was that it was a fun book. Yeah, it did, it had a lot of illustrations, and it was you know, it was so engaging. It was kind of the first uh, uh, graphic novel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> it was true. put together at this uh, commune up in the mountains in New Mexico by a bunch of hippie artists. It really spoke to people of that moment. And Ram Dass continued to. So I just wondered if you could take us back um, to where Ram Dass really started. He started out as a psychologist. And, and tell us about the trajectory of his life and how it led him to India. Well, I didn't know uh, that much about his earlier life until we really started working on this uh, memoir. Um, but um, he grew up around Boston. He was, a, uh, his father had been the uh, president of the New Haven Railroad, which was a big, you know, Northeastern uh, uh, conglomerate at the time. 
and um, he was a lawyer. They were a, a pretty power-oriented family, mm -hmm. and Ramdas mm -hmm. got a lot of that growing up. But um, he got into psychology when he was in college. He, he was sort of uh, um, had his difficulties growing up. His uh, had a very uh, kind of dominant mother, and um, he. Um, was attracted to psychology because it gave him a sense of identity that he hadn't had up to that point. And um, he went through um, graduate school at uh, Wesleyan, which is where I met him later. And mm. uh, then uh, at Stanford and uh, he ended up teaching at Stanford uh, which was unusual because he went from being a graduate student to a professor and um, um, there are some funny episodes around that because he had failed some courses as a graduate student and then he ends up being a professor and his uh, old professors are really surprised to see him at a faculty meeting. <laughs> um, and then uh, his mentor um, early on had moved to uh, Harvard by that point and he invited uh, Richard Alpert to uh, come teach at Harvard, which he did. And he met Timothy Leary there. And they started uh, working with um, psychedelics, which were thoroughly legal at the time. And um, it became a, a really exciting field. This is in the uh, early 60s. And um, it got a little too exciting. And eventually they got kicked out of Harvard. Um, and that's kind of where the story picks up at the beginning of the memoir. Uh, it's really interesting because, you know, kind of what you've described is this like blazing trajectory that he was on, you know, is that he must, you know, clearly was very mm -hmm. brilliant to have been able to make those steps at Harvard, from Stanford to Harvard to, you know, and then he kind of, that's where he, what, jumped off the, yeah. the, the, the straight and narrow path. Well, he was terribly insecure as an intellectual. Uh, and he always thought he didn't know much. But he was a great teacher and storyteller. And that um, um, made him uh, very popular as a professor. Um, uh -huh. And um, so that part... Uh, worked out pretty well, but um, he uh, was always pulled into that place of trying to uh, find his true identity. And I think that was what propelled him into psychedelics and later to India. It was a kind of um, real, very passionate curiosity from what I read in the book. Yeah. Um, and he always had that uh, kind of, uh, as long as I knew him anyway, that self-deprecating humor about everything, which mm -hmm. I think uh, eased the way for a lot of us. And you knew him all the way through, Ramesh. I mean, you knew him very early on, and we're going to get to that about, you know, yeah. your, I didn't all know the Richard, way though. to his last to the yeah. end, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't know, you knew Ram Dass, but not Richard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I met Ram Dass. And, and, and he the, talks about himself in the book as very, those distinct sides. And yeah, it's point, almost as if he had three incarnations in, uh, in one, you know, the psychology part and then mm -hmm. all of that uh, really pretty revolutionary psychedelic work, um, yeah. which now is getting picked up again. Um, right. And, and the, um, the becoming that spiritual uh, bridge between uh, Eastern and Western spiritual practice, I think, was uh, kind of that was the, the final part of his life and certainly the one that we're remembering him uh, for now. And I think that he really uh, did make a cultural uh, um, in road that has uh, is still reverberating, and it's yeah. curious how many of the 
uh, younger generations are now picking up on that. I'm curious um, because you you were with him at the end, right? Mm -hmm. You spent a lot of time with him as he was after his stroke and in the years that he was embracing his his mortality. Do you feel like he that he saw himself that he fully grasped what he had done and what he had brought and the impact that he had? I think that he um, he didn't take it as personally as a kind of an accomplishment that um, we might mm -hmm. think. I, th I think mm -hmm. that he felt that he had um, received a, a tremendous grace in his life, mm -hmm. a, a real gift from from the uh, the guru in India, particularly, and also through the associations with Tim Leary and Aldous Huxley and Allen Ginsberg and the mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. and Alan Watts. You know, he he had gotten. Uh, a pretty good dose even before he went to India. So in a way you could say he saw himself as privileged and he was humble about the privileges that he had. Well, I think through the, uh, both the, the psychedelic and the spiritual work, he, he really uh, came to understand that the uh, personality part of his existence was not the dominant piece. And he had studied uh, achievement motivation. He did his master's degree in achievement motivation. Wow, how and, interesting. Uh, yeah. So, <sighs> uh, you know, seeing that through the lens of uh, yoga and um, the, the Buddhist approach of desirelessness, yeah. that doesn't quite line up with Western achievement motivation. <laughs> I'm really struck by what a kind of um, departure that must have been from his upbringing. Yeah. It's Valentine's Day, so let's talk a little bit about love and how Ram Dass, <laughs> how Ram Dass experienced love in his life and how it influenced his spiritual path. Well, the, the uh, spiritual path that he undertook in India was what's uh, known as uh, bhakti, which is the devotional path. And um, there, it's highly developed in the Indian, um, you know, view of things. There are nine different kinds of uh, bhakti that you can pursue. You, uh, but all of them are um, attitudes toward the divine that you kind of assume as a, uh, an aspirant uh, um, moving toward that final merging with uh, the ultimate, with the divine. And, um, it, you know, there are the different incarnations of Ram and Krishna, and um, you can adopt, um, you can see God as your lover, you can see God as your child, you can see God as the mother. You can uh, see God as the pure absolute. And there's just this wonderful dance that uh, uh, basically um, you can adapt to whatever feels like it's what you need. So mm -hmm. um, he really, uh, you know, pursued that and it, it, um, uh, the guru that he met, who was uh, named after a train station. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. Neem Karoli Baba <laughs> was his guru. And yeah. there's a train station called Neem Karoli or ah. Neem Karari, and, uh, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, so his mother named him after that, where that was his assumed name? No, that was uh, an assumed name. That okay. he he was given that name by the locals because he stopped a train there. I'd love for you to tell us more about Neem Curly Baba. I know that you spent time with him as well, and he was so pivotal in Ramdas's journey. Can you just tell us a little bit more about him, 
what he was like as a teacher, the impact he had on Ram Dass and, you know, and, and the impact he's had on you. Yeah, I'm going to attempt a, a screen share here and I'll just talk over it if I can make okay. it work. Okay. So this is a photograph of Neem Karoli Baba, uh, who was often, this was the way that I saw him. And this was toward the latter end of his life. Um, and uh, this was, uh, I saw him up in the foothills of the Himalayas, which is where Ramdas uh, met him also. It was just extraordinary being around him. It, it was not uh, like, uh, you know, going to classes and getting a teaching. Mm -hmm. He was just uh, hanging out. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this little temple in the uh, bottom of a valley up at about 7,000 feet in the Himalayas. And this is where Ramdas. Um, first uh, spent a winter when he uh, learned yoga and meditation for the first time. And um, Maharaji had um, kind of uh, this, the story is in great detail in the a book. And we actually went back and um, kind of went over the details uh, um, again, because he had related the same incident in uh, Be Here Now, which was the uh, kind of fundamental turning point in his life. Mm -hmm. And um, it was clear that Maharaji had done something to him that uh, uh, LSD hadn't, and that all of the uh, psychology that he had come to understand had not shown him about his own existence and it was about love. And when he met Maharaji, it was clear that, uh, and I think his first impression was that Maharaji had these great psychic powers and he, he mm. told him something about his mother that no one else could possibly have uh, known and it just blew his mind. But, um, at that point, he realized that Maharaji knew everything about him and including all the most shameful things that he didn't want people to know. And he finally looks up at Maharaji and realizing that Maharaji knows all this shit about him that he really would prefer that <laughs> was not uh, known by anybody else. And um, all this sense of shame and, you know, things about his sexuality and the power stuff that, you know, he had suppressed for so many years. And he looks up at Maharaji and Maharaji is just uh, looking at him with what Ramdas described as unconditional love. He knew that he knew all that stuff, but he still loved him with this incredible uh, just um, full love and that it, it overpowered him. It took away all of the shame and he was able to let go. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. was able to let go because that uh, love made it safe. Mm -hmm. What were the, you know, you were there to, um, what did you learn from Neem Karoli Baba? Like, what was your impression of him? And, and were you with Ram Dass there as well? I mean, were you, did you guys? I, I was uh, with him when he came back for the second time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, uh, I went before he came back for the second time with um, mm -hmm. um, two friends that had started uh, studying with Ram Dass also, uh, one of whom is uh, Krishna Das, who does chanting these days. Mm -hmm. And um, Danny Goldman, who uh, wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence and was a psychologist mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so the three of us somehow managed to get there because Ram Dass had be been given instruction by Maharaji when he went back to the States for the first time, not to talk about him, which was all he did when he came back. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, 
but he didn't give his uh, his name or location. So uh, we somehow, I, that's a longer story of how we managed to uh, get sort of permission to go see him. Mm -hmm. But the feeling of being with him, which was the same that I had when I first met Ramdas when he came back, it was so mm -hmm. clear to me that um, Neem Karoli Baba had come through Ramdas. It was almost like, you know, a hand reaching out and grabbing mm -hmm. me. And I, I didn't start out being interested in India or, uh, you know, monkey gods like Hanuman that uh, <laughs> we went to see. And, um, but the feeling around him was so um, really, um, uh, first of all, that sense of love. And, but also just, uh, I remember approaching that temple down in the valley and feeling like I was coming home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the feeling that I had had when I used to visit my uh, grandparents, which was my favorite, you know, place to visit. They had a summer place where I, I live now uh, out by the beach. And um, it was the greatest, it was freedom. And that was what that place felt like with being with Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba. And he just, uh, he, uh, he didn't teach that much. I mean, he didn't say that much. He, he mostly, mm -hmm. uh, we would just hang out with him and he fed us uh, the first time. Uh, I think I was half out of my body when I got there and uh, he said, feed them. So mm -hmm. they sat us down and they brought us these leaf plates and piled them up with uh, spicy potatoes and uh, puris, yeah. which are the deep fried flatbread fried in butter and ghee. And uh, to 17 puris and three piles of potatoes oh before I got grounded. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's really making me hungry. I don't know about the other people on the call. You've got good I, Indian restaurants. Making in me Vancouver. really hungry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to, um, you know, say these are amazing stories. You know, I, I, I wouldn't want to, I mean, like, it's interesting, you know, how these stories get spun, you know, and there's just sort of symbolism and, you know, mythology that they create around a person. Um, mm -hmm. But back to the person who was Ram Dass and who, you know, preceded him. How did you meet him? Well, you already told us how you met him. What were the key things you learned from each other? Well, I think I got that uh, sense of his identity search very early on, and it, it fit into where I was at that time. I was in my junior year in university and uh, I was really looking and it was a very mm -hmm. turbulent time as you would remember or have read right. and um, yeah. the uh, the draft was hanging over me mm. um, for Vietnam um, and um, the psychological part of it was interesting, but uh, the uh, the deeper part of that sense of um, a shift in point of view, mm -hmm. and the shift was from uh, it was like from seeing yourself at the center of the universe to seeing yourself as a, a grain of sand on the beach. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that yeah. real change uh, of uh, uh, Ramdas often described it as from ego to soul. And um, I think that was what Maharaji represented, represents. It's the, it's not an outer being, although it was really fun hanging out with him and this old guy in a blanket who was just, uh, you know, feeding and loving us all the time. But um, it was an inner place. 
And that was mm -hmm. what uh, pulled Ramdas in and certainly pulled uh, others of us. Ramdas nearly died of a stroke in 1997 uh, when he was only 66 yeah. years old. How did he change after that? Well, it, it almost took him out. Uh, they, mm -hmm. He was not expected to live from that stroke. It was a, um, it was not a blockage. It was a bleed in his brain, and it, um, um, he had almost complete aphasia. I mean, he couldn't mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. uh, one side of his body was paralyzed, and that persisted mostly through the rest of his life, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, he lived for more than two decades after that, but he was pretty wheelchair bound after that. But the, the uh, psychological and emotional effect of it was uh, even greater than the physical. And he, uh, he went through this crisis of uh, faith and in Maharaji who, who he had essentially surrendered his life to that spiritual place that Maharaji represented um, for him. And um, he was like, um, you know, where were you when I had the stroke? Were you out to lunch or something? And it, it took him really down into a deep depression for a while. Um, real, I thought it uh, was really phenomenal. Dark you, night of the soul. Yeah, you in describing in the book um, how he came out of that, or you know maybe while he was in it, but he was still he would he recovered enough to actually go and teach, and that you described it as, or you guys described it as. He, he wove in his uh, limitations into the talk itself. I just thought that was fascinating and, you know, really, really kind of remarkable that, you know, he could get up and he could, you know, with his limitations that, you know, to his speech, he could still, you know, put himself out there that way. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, clearly people still found it valuable to listen to him. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, it was a tremendous uh, effort uh, just to get back enough speech to uh, be able to communicate. And uh, a, a mutual uh, friend of ours, Mickey Lemley, mm -hmm. made this great film about that period in his life when he was just recovering from the stroke uh, called uh, Fierce Grace, which is... Uh, uh, well, he later decided it, that was maybe a misnomer, <laughs> but uh, I, I can go into that more. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, Ramdas did, or or, may, or the filmmaker well, did. Well, Ramdas got a um, Ramdas came to see the stroke as um, <clears throat> part of his work on himself, as Maharaji's grace, as he saw everything else in his life as being a teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of, I think, what's so powerful um, in that his life became kind of a parable of his teaching also. Um, but um, there's a woman who uh, was the, let me see if I can find a quick photo of her. Um, her name is Sidi Ma, and uh, she was a... Uh, uh, housewife in, uh, she used to um, come and take care of Maharaji at the temple mm -hmm. in the mountains. Uh, and um, after she had had her own uh, family and um, she was shown the movie. This is after Maharaji left the body and after Ramdas stroke. Um, and um, Ramdas had been saying, well, Ma Maharaji gave me the stroke as part of my work on myself. And Siddhima said, Maharaji would never give you a stroke. 
I mean, the stroke was, she said it, it was part of nature and meaning it was part of his karma. And it's true. I mean, he had uh, stopped taking his blood pressure medication from what I've been able to understand about the, mm. the stroke. And that may have been, and there, and there were stresses in his life. He had uh, um, been working on a book about aging and yeah. um, he was trying to imagine what it would be like uh, to be old and infirm. And uh, then he had the stroke wow. and he couldn't finish the book. Uh, so eventually he got uh, help from another writer, a guy named Mark Matuzic, who I think you may know also, he's a wonderful writer who uh, helped him finish uh, Still Here, which was the book he was working on. And, uh, interestingly, I, we worked with the same editor who had worked on Still Here, who had been at, uh, I think, Random House at the time. And um, uh, she helped us put this book together. But um, when she heard about the stroke, Ramdas' secretary called her and uh, uh, the first thing Amy said was, what about the book? <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> you probably know where that one comes yeah, from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Ramesh, I'm just like listening to this, you know, to you talk about um, Ramdas's thoughts about um, name Kareli, Kareli Baba, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like he really thought of him as, um, you know, like as, as God, like God, you know, like he could have give him a stroke or not give him a stroke. Mm -hmm. Um, I, that's like, did he actually think that this man was like, can you just explain that, unpack that a little bit? Well, Maharaji, uh, the main thing he kept saying to people was uh, uh, sub ek, which in Hindi means uh, uh, it's all one. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, d don't you see? It's, it's all one. And we're all one. And it's from that place of unity. And it was clear that he uh, somehow lived, um, you know, with kind of one foot in uh, this physical world and one foot in uh, uh, the transcendent. Mm -hmm. And it was all, it was not different uh, for him. And, and I think that was, you know, as close as we can come to uh, realizing what a uh, uh, God-like state might be, that might be what it's about. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, I know anything about that because I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and very clearly, I think my, the more I have worked on myself, the more I don't know. And that seems to be uh, as far as I'm gonna get in this lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it sounds like Ram Dass really, you know, had that's what Maharaji represented, though, and represented not just the to him, like yeah. yeah, and for other people too. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, There's a great your... uh, saint mm -hmm. named Ramana Maharshi who says, uh, uh, "God, Guru, and self are the same." Mm -hmm. So that's that level of uh, identity that uh, is, I think, Ramdas not only aspired to, but occasionally touched. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. where, you know, Maharaji was the model for that. Yeah, and that's really, you know, a particular practice and a particular way of seeing the world that, you know, is mm -hmm. one of many and it's, it's fascinating. What was your process like working with him on this book? It, it took you 10 years which is phenomenal. You both must have gone through so much over that time. Can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, it, I, I'm not the uh, fastest uh, writer or typist, and, um, but his aphasia had slowed down his 
speech to the point where mostly I could uh, type as fast as he could talk. And I, so we were just, I started out uh, recording uh, things and uh, just talking with him and, and then uh, realized we could put it directly into uh, text. Mm -hmm. So um, we would uh, write stuff down and then I would read it back to him and uh, he would comment again, again on it. I mean, the, the aphasia did not affect his cognitive uh, ability. He knew exactly what he wanted to say mm -hmm. and pretty much mm -hmm. how he wanted to say it too. So if mm -hmm. if I didn't get it uh, down the way he wanted it, we went around until we did. And that was part of that process. And uh, the slow speech, I mean, was uh, definitely, I think it was uh, uh, Wavy Gravy who said he, uh, Ramdas went from being the master of the one-liner <laughs> to the master of the ocean liner. <laughs> Wavy gravy, am, am I right? He was a clown? Yeah, he's the uh, clown prince of the hog farm commune that uh, <laughs> made breakfast in bed for uh, 300,000 people at Woodstock. Wow. And he's still around, wow. he's an amazing being. And uh, they came together in the uh, Seva Foundation which is, you know, something. Tell about, us about Seva. Well, Seva, uh, the, um, it came out of um, two things. One was uh, a group of people who had been involved in the smallpox eradication program in India, mm -hmm. which India and Bangladesh were the last places there was any smallpox and smallpox is the, really the only, uh, major disease scourge of, you know, had killed millions and millions of people over time and, and it was eradicated and India was the last campaign mm -hmm. for that. And um, a uh, hippie doctor named Larry Brilliant had arrived at Maharaji's ashram and Maharaji told him to go to work for WHO and smallpox eradication. And he, he, there's a, a quite a wonderful book that he wrote called Sometimes Brilliant. Hmm. But um, <laughs> he went to the WHO office in Delhi where they were running this uh, program from. And uh, he had a, was dressed in his ashram whites with a long ponytail. And uh, <laughs> they said, no, we don't think so. We don't have a job for you. <laughs> and... Uh, he went back and forth and Maharaji kept telling him to go work for WHO and he, he would turn up there and finally they said, okay, look, maybe we can find you something doing the education work. And Larry ends up being the second in command of the international doctors working for, uh, of the whole program in, in uh, India. And, uh, after that, he uh, took a, a master's in public health, and he's been uh, on the forefront of uh, a lot of the, uh, well, the pandemic at this point. He's been uh, on CNN a lot and advising people. Well, and, Safe uh, has had, I know, you know, I've watched So they Safe started Earth. that foundation. And I've watched it unfold over the years, and it's had, mm -hmm. you know, such huge impact on um, people's lives, yeah. but I found it really um, poignant in the book, and, and I actually knew this when it, I remember hearing about this when it happened, that when Ram Dass had a stroke, he had spent a lot of his life raising money for other people, and can you just Save talk about that a little bit, <laughs> Seva particularly, and I don't know how much money he raised, but I'm sure it was a lot, maybe in the millions. Um, but when, but when he had a stroke, he found himself quite um, broke. Yeah, he was. Um, he always, you know, did raise money for other people. He, he kept as much as he needed to, you know, keep uh, traveling and lecturing. And that was about it. And, and for instance, the money from uh, Be Here Now, the royalties from that book, all went to Lama Foundation, where it had been. 
uh, made and it kept them, you know, a lot of communes went down. What was the, the Lama Foundation? The Lama Foundation was a group of, uh, was kind of a, uh, an eclectic spiritual commune that was founded by a guy named Steve Durkee and his wife, Barbara, who's now named Asha and uh, a couple of other people and Ramdas and they had been living together in California and they envisioned this uh, eclectic spiritual place where people could come and work on themselves without a lot of other baggage. And so uh, all of the fun, so I, do you have any idea how much money that book has made over the years? Uh, it's still making money. And like in I, the, like, it's, it's, was it a best sell, an international bestseller? Or was yeah, that, if you look on Amazon under spiritual books, it's still like number six or something. So that, I mean, that to me, uh, you know, that, that has a very heartbreaking quality to it that, you know, Ram Dass found himself in such dire straits financially. Um, mm -hmm. But as I recall reading the book, people came forward and really tried to help him along with that. But yeah. Um, it still must have been really, really hard. And that brings me to my next question, which is just, and this is my last question, and then I'm going to look at questions from our participants. If Ram Dass were here with us right now, like what would his advice be for living through COVID-19, the onslaught of disinformation, and just all the massive uncertainties we face in society today? Well, I think it would be the the Valentine's Day message of love everyone. And, uh, you know, he used to keep uh, uh, George Bush and before that Casper Weinberger and then Trump on his puja table on his altar. <laughs> uh huh. And, you know, he said, look, you know, see them as souls too. Uh, they're having a pretty pretty bad incarnation, but <laughs> they are also souls. We are all souls on a journey and don't get caught up in the roles that people are taking. But uh, I think he would also emphasize that this is a time to uh, practice. You know, I mean, these kinds of periods or this is when the rubber meets the road so what when you say practice what would that mean on a practice on a practical level <sighs> well certainly the tools that um he brought to people both the psychological and spiritual practices mm -hmm. and i mean starting with what we were talking about earlier that place of identity which mm -hmm. uh, he often called uh, witnessing, you know, seeing yourself from uh, not just the standpoint of your ego, but from that soul mm -hmm. place and understanding that um, this is a, uh, um, as the Buddhists say, it's uh, temporary, temporal, mm -hmm. impermanent. And, um, that there's suffering on this plane of reality of which we're thoroughly aware at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that um, it's impersonal. I mean, it's not, uh, we all take it as uh, being all about us. And we're all wedded to our um, storylines and our biographies and who we, he kept saying, you're not who you think you are. Don't get caught in the thoughts, in the ego thoughts of who you think you are. And mm -hmm. working with that part of it, the psychological that you can do through meditation is one aspect of it. Using the uh, devotional practices of uh, kirtan, chanting, mantra, just using the divine, the names or the prayers that work for you and whatever tradition uh, comes your way that works for you. 
and understanding that uh, you can serve in whatever capacity you have at hand. I think that service and devotion message was one of the most uh, uh, powerful for this time. And uh, Maharaji was in uh, all of the little temples that he had and the ashrams were uh, all had the presence of this uh, monkey god, Hanuman. And we, we have a, a little temple in Taos, New Mexico, which has a, a, a marble Hanuman from India. Uh, and uh, that Hanuman is a figure in the Ramayana who is the embodiment of service and devotion. That is so interesting. And we have a lot of questions. So, I, but, I, but I just want to say that one of the things that was always striking to me and hearing stories over the years about him was about Neem Curly Baba was, you probably told me this, that he, um, he just said, feed people. Yeah. And feed people is like a great service. Mm -hmm. And I think that has, you know, there's so many, there's so much resonance to that and in interpretation she could make what feed people, nourish people, yeah. take care what of other people. What level of feeding that is and all of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. But I love just the very basic part about, mm -hmm. you know, just literally bringing Yeah. He used to say, you know, he the, the valley where the temple was and uh, the hills was uh, mm -hmm. very poor. And, um, all the school kids would come there and he, he would feed them. And uh, the people from around the valley uh, were uh, fed there. And he, he used to say, uh, uh, first bojan, then bhajan. Where bojan mm -hmm. is like your meal. And bhajan is singing to God. Mm -hmm. So you got to you got to fill your belly before you can do spiritual practice. You, you have to take care of the necessities for people. And he did that. And that was the, the feeling of uh, grace, I think, that came through so often and that kind of uh, giving. Ramesh, um, we're only going to have questions? time for like one or two questions, but I want to start right. at the something. beginning of the questions from Minalee Johnstone. How did you get your name, Ramesh, Rameshwar Das? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the Dasas are servants, which is like a Hanuman name. So Ram Das is the servant of Ram, who's this uh, incarnation. And it's also a name for Hanuman. So it comes back to that service and devotion issue. Um, I was rather um, stubborn. So... Um, I figured if Maharaji wanted to give me a name, he'd give me a name. And I was kind of stiff necked about that. So I'm in India for uh, a year and a half when I first got there on a three month tourist visa. And eventually I got uh, thrown out and I got something called a quit India notice, which means you better get out or we're never going to let you back again. And um, so I, I finally went to Maharaji and I asked him for a name. And he said, Ramesh Wardas. And it was like, you know, he knew what my name was. <laughs> he, just, he was waiting for me to ask. So most of the Indian devotees in India still know me as Jim, which was my given name. <laughs> and uh, that's how that came about. It was kind of a dance and it was a very uh, sort of, uh, uh, it, was, it was funny. And uh, Rameshwar is also uh, a name of, uh, it's a servant name. And Rameshwar is a name of Shiva, but it's a very sort of loving aspect of Shiva. So I'm a servant of uh, the Lord of Ram. So this question is from uh, someone that I think you know and love well. Andrea Rabinowitz. Oh, good. <laughs> For those of you on the call, that's, that's my uh, mother-in-law. <laughs> right. Um, 
what were Maharaji's early years? What was his growing up like? What was his family like? Well, he came from a landowning family outside of <laughs> Agra. And um, he, um, um, his mother died when he was quite young. Um, and his father remarried and the, uh, his stepmother was not much older than uh, Maharaji, who was named, uh, his, he wasn't called Maharaji at that point. He was uh, Lakshmi Narayan Sharma. And um, he um, had a really hard time with his stepmother. And he, uh, when he was about 12, he left home. And he went off and became what's called a sadhu in India, which is like a wandering monk or yogi. Um, and there's a period from when he was 12 until he was about 20 when we know very little about what happened with him. But when he came, uh, what happened was his uh, father uh, was told by somebody he knew that Maharaji had been seen at a, uh, a town some distance away. And the father went and uh, got him. And Maharaji had been uh, betrothed. Uh, it was a child marriage, which was the custom in India. Uh, but the marriage hadn't been, uh, you know, he hadn't been married. He'd just been, but this, uh, so his father convinced him to come back and take up his family responsibilities. And um, he did, and he uh, uh, was married and had uh, three children, which we didn't know anything about until after he left his body, until after he died. And um, he had this sort of uh, dual life which we knew nothing about. I mean, we knew him as this uh, sweet old man in the blanket who was a guru to thousands of Indians, who people came and went all the time for advice. They would ask him for help getting jobs with health issues, with stuff with their families. And uh, he was known as uh, uh, a guru who gave out, he was known as a miracle Baba, basically. And uh, his blessings were pretty efficient. So a lot of people came to see him, including, uh, well, this is the, the funny part of the story, but long after he left his body in, um, was it 2015 or 16? Um, my wife and I were staying at the ashram in India and Prime Minister Modi was visiting in California. And he went to, to Silicon Valley. And uh, he met um, um, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, uh, who of course is kind of a, uh, a mega hero in India. And um, Mark Zuckerberg told him how uh, Steve Jobs from Apple had recommended that Mark at a time when Facebook was uh, going through a really hard time, and so was Mark, uh, that he visit this temple in North India, which happened to be the Kenchi Ashram where we were staying. So uh, the next day, uh, there are all these uh, India TV trucks parked outside the ashram. <laughs> but Mark didn't ever go. He did. He did yeah, go to the ashram. He did. He did kind of a retreat there. This was after Maharaji left his body. Well. And Steve God. Jobs visited there also. Maybe he needs to go spend a lot more time there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not I, vouching for anything, except that uh, every uh, Indian entrepreneur now wanted the blessings of Kenchi. 
<laughs> oh my God, that is so funny. So my um, wife gets interviewed uh, outside the temple gates and uh, they asked her what it was like being with somebody who had actually been with uh, Maharaji. And she said, all I know is that he loves Maharaji more than he loves me. <laughs> On All India TV. <laughs> oh, man. oh my God. Well, um, that's really interesting. We're, we're going to have uh, to wind up now, but I just wanted to say, listening to you talk about that story of the dual kind of personalities of, of Neem Karoli Baba, that that's a reflection too of what, what I learned about Ram Dass in your book, you know, Richard Albert versus Ram Dass. And so I just want to say, you know, it's a fascinating book and congratulations, Ramesh, on completing it and, you know, highly recommend it to everyone. So thank you so much. It's been great to see you today. And Jacob, I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you both for this incredible conversation. My big takeaway is just those two things, to love people and feed them. Yeah, that was really the core. That was the basic teaching. It's been uh, an honor to have you both here. And I want to also thank, uh, looks like there were 100 people here from all over the world. And I want to thank all of you for coming out. Mind everybody, you can purchase the book, Being Ram Das from Banyan Books. And um, again, such an honor to have you both. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Ramesh. Mm -hmm.